All right, this is episode G of Rakaia 1899. I'm on Antigua Street in Otautahi, Christchurch, but in 1899, this was Windmill Road in the borough of Sydenham. On the morning of the 11th of March 1899, William Hodson, who lived at number 56 Windmill Road, made his way to the Christchurch Railway Station, which is in that direction. He would have gone across the tracks, turned right and walked down South Belt until he arrived at the station. William was a lad of not quite 16 years and he worked as an office boy for a seed merchant based in Cashel Street in the city. Along the way he met up with his cobber Len Hunter who also resided with his family on Windmill Road. They were heading to the railway station because that particular Saturday was the day of the Islington Freezing Works picnic and Victorians loved going to things. Mr and Mrs Rowland of Rickerton and their four children caught their train at Addington. Not that Addington or that Addington, but an older Addington in about that direction. Charlotte Pierce, aged 11 and living on North Road in Papanui along with her family, uh, also caught one of the trains at either Christchurch or Addington. Crikey! Mr Charles Jeffs, a farmer of Templeton, caught one of the trains here at Templeton, along with his wife and three daughters. Also boarding at Templeton was Annie Bowden and her son Richard, a babe in arms, as the expression goes, of scarcely six months old. Annie, Franks and Fanny Jones and their sister-in-law Ada left the hotel at Yaldhurst, which is, I'm guessing, in that direction. Uh, and that hotel was run by Annie and Fanny's father. They left home about 7am that morning. A bit later, 7.20am, but also in Yardhurst, Rose Harwood and her family left their home and both groups caught their train here, or rather over there, at the Islington Railway Station. They rode in the same carriage, so it may be that they knew each other. Mr James Johnston farmer of West Melton, kind of that way I guess, uh, caught one of the trains at Rolleston with his two sons aged 15 and 19. Estimates vary as to how many people were on the trains and with the passing of 123 years since the picnic we will never know because it was never written down at the time exactly what sort of numbers travelled on the trains. But the names of the people I mentioned and the places they lived gives us a feel for the humanity involved in or on those picnic trains dash Burton and back. Many of those people lacked any obvious connection with the Christchurch Meat Company or the Islington Works. Unfortunately, it rained that Saturday and it was cold uh, bitterly cold though and there was early snow uh, falling on the mid Canterbury high country and there were other events scheduled for that day like the Leaston Produce Fair, uh, cricket matches between Ellesmere and South Canterbury, between Southbridge and Irwell, they were all either abandoned or postponed. But not the Islington Freezing Works, they soldiered on like a good bunch of Victorians.
It rained that Saturday and it was cold. And that's a shame because the Ashburton Domain on a Saturday like this Saturday in March would be a great place for a picnic. But the good people of Ashburton came through for the picnic committee and the arcade and the Orange Hall were made available. One for games and the other for dancing. So at least the picnic went ahead in, albeit, a slightly different form. And that's not to say that everybody on the train travelled for the picnic. The Harwoods actually travelled to see family in Ashburton. Family that Rose, at 16 years of age, had not previously met. Mr Johnson would take the opportunity, for instance, and he wasn't the only one, to get well drunk. The trains make good time on their run south, with the first being more full than the second. Jesse Parsons was on duty as station master at Ashburton when the trains rolled in fairly to time, the first around 10.15am, the second 10 or so minutes later. And from Ashburton's railway station, the passengers on each train made their way to the arcade, or to the Orange Hall, or to the homes of family or friends, or to licensed premises. Some may even have come to the domain. The respective train crews would have been obliged to clear the platform loop and the main line as soon as the passengers had alighted, because there were plenty of train movements scheduled through Ashburton that day. So carriages were placed into sidings and the locomotives were taken to the sheds for overhauling, as the expression went back then. So as the picnickers and the train crew enjoyed as best they could their day in Ashburton, the terrible weather that had impacted on fares and cricket and picnics impacted on train movements as the outbound mixed train from Christchurch to Springfield ran late because of it. And because that train ran late, its reciprocal service, the same locomotive, same guards van, same crews, differently marshalled train ran late as well. And as we saw back in episode E, there's a flow on effect when a train runs late. And that flow on effect was that train 21 South the mixed train from Christchurch to Ashburton, the train we've heard a lot about so far in Rakai 1899, was predestined to run late, as it was expected to hold at Rolleston for that inbound train from Springfield to Christchurch. So as train 21 South left Christchurch at 4.40pm that afternoon, and as the picnic train's crews made their way to the engine shed or the station building, or their guards vans, and as the picnickers walked, rode, or staggered back to the trains, the first cog in the Rakai disaster's wheel of misfortune had already been set by that far off and late running train. The first picnic train left Ashburton on time at 6.05 p.m. Once more, it was more full than the second. Driver Michael Gardner had already arranged with William Highland that he would break the train with the air and handbrake on the lead locomotive only and that the second locomotive, Highland's locomotive, should only break if called upon to do so by whistle. Gardner also had a discussion with his guard, Henry Curson, about the guard's request to arrive two minutes early into Rakaia that Gardner agreed to this request and managed to complete it in a locomotive without a speedometer impresses the hell out of me, frankly. Meanwhile, with respect to the second picnic train, the next cog in the wheel of misfortune came with a partial disrailment of that train's van. Derailments of this nature happened all the time, and if it were to happen, the best bet is to have it happen in a yard where there's plenty of muscle and plenty of equipment to set the van right. 6.15, the scheduled time for the second picnic train came and went. By 6.35 p.m. the second picnic train was in a position to depart. So Parsons was able to authorise the second train to start by signalling its guard, William Clemson, by outstretching his right hand. William Clemson was at the north end of the platform so that he had a line of sight to Harry Carter up on U284 
And this is where the unique nature of Ashburton's yard comes into play. Because if you remember from episode C, the platform road was on a loop. The main road was one out. And the locomotive and five of the leading carriages were actually out on the main line. So William Clemson had to come quite far forward on Ashburton's platform in order to have a line of sight to Harry Carter. Clemson extended his hand no ball style and he blew his whistle and with that Charles Henry Carter put the second picnic train in motion and Francis Delamonte Matha began a run where he shoveled light and often damn near the whole way to Rakaia. And in the growing gloom of a frightfully wet and cold and miserable Saturday in March, the second picnic train set off on its high speed run into the colony's worst railway disaster some 17 miles and six chains up the line at Rakaia. Subscribe, ring the bell, feel free to comment.